Good evening, and welcome to tonight's author talk with Dr. Elizabeth Barron. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. I have heard from many of you who are truly enjoying this digital programming format and you want it to continue. I assure you, we hear you, and we are working on a great plan with our historians for the rest of 2020. We can't thank you enough for all the support to be able to make this happen. Do know that you are helping to ensure that Mr. Lincoln's legacy lives on. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Elizabeth Barron to discuss her latest book, Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War. This was named Wall Street Journal's 10 Best Nonfiction Books in 2019. Dr. Barron is a professor of American history at the University of Virginia, received her PhD from Yale. She's also a specialist in the Civil War era in the 19th century South. In addition, she's written five books, including this one tonight that we will discuss. We're also joined tonight by Dr. Christian McWhorter, our very own ALPLM Lincoln historian. Dr. McWhorter and Dr. Barron will have a discussion. We'll entertain questions throughout the night, so we encourage you to type your questions below in the Q&A box, and I will get those um, asked. We hope to get all to all of them, but we may not. Um, if we don't, we'll give you contact information on how to get those questions answered. So again, thank you so much for joining us, and please help me welcome Christian and Liz, and we'll get started. Thank you. All right, thanks for uh, that introduction, Jamie. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here with uh, with Liz Barron tonight, uh, and we'll be talking about uh, Armies of Deliverance. Thank you <laughs> so. for the question to cover there. That's great. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm happy to do it. Um, I uh, I was planning on reading it anyway, and this interview uh, gave me a perfect excuse mm -hmm. to uh, to tackle it. It's uh, it's a good book, um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm happy we'll get to, to chat a little about it. So um, the main uh, thing I want to get to, uh, first of all, I think is, is um, you know, it's right there in the title. You, um, the, the book is a, is a narrative of the entire Civil War, and I, we can talk a little about that later too, that it's, a, it's a, a, syn a synthesis and a broad history of the Civil War, but this theme of deliverance um, goes all the way through. So yeah, let's start with, a, with you, uh, Talking about deliverance, what you mean by that term, and how does it fit in with the Civil War? Yeah. Sure, uh, 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 happy to do. Let me just start by saying thank you for this invitation, and thank you to all of you who are watching. Again, uh, your support for institutions like this venerable, very important institution is so, so, uh, so much appreciated. So, deliverance. You know, as Jamie mentioned in the intro, I am a historian of the 19th century. Most of my research has been on the South. I was commissioned to write a, uh, a book that would cover all of Civil War history that was suitable for classroom use as a textbook. We can come back to some of those challenges down the line. But as I set out, I was really interested in deepening my understanding of Northern politics and particularly in the question of how Lincoln and the North's other leaders galvanized public opinion and then sustained Northern morale over the course of this long bloody war. You know, as we know, Lincoln represented a kind of moderate middle of the Northern political spectrum, but, but it was a quite broad spectrum. To, on the left, if you will, uh, you, you had radical Republicans and abolitionists who really wanted the government to be uh, proactive and aggressive in dismantling slavery. And to Lincoln's right, you had conservative Democrats who were anti-abolition and who warned him not to be aggressive in taking measures to dismantle slavery. Uh, and then in the broad middle, you had people like Lincoln who were uneasy about both abolition uh, uh, and about slavery. And so how it was that uh, that, that fractious Northern population uh, coalesced uh, into a coalition that could fight and win this long war is, is what I wanted to, to get to the heart of. And, and what I discovered in my research was that Northerners coalesced around this political theme of deliverance. Uh, and it's the word crops up a lot in, in Civil War rhetoric, but it's really the concept that's even more important than the word. And the concept of a war of deliverance, uh, Northerners claimed to be fighting a war of deliverance was a war to 
to save the Southern masses from corrupt Southern leaders. That's how Northerners conceptualize the war. Uh, that's a mission uh, uh, that, um, that many different segments of the Northern population could, could embrace. So I make the case in this book that deliverance is a theme. The war is a war to deliver uh, the Southern masses from uh, slave power aristocrats, secessionists who have their, their, their uh, who've dominated Southern politics. The war is a war to deliver to the Southern masses the blessings of free society. That um, idea I discover was so compelling that it drew followers like a magnet to the Union cause and enabled Lincoln to form this uh, enduring coalition. I also find, and this was the most uh, surprising thing, I, I didn't uh, come to this project with this theme. It emerged as I was doing my research. Um, the most surprising thing to me was that this belief that the Union War was a war to save the Southern masses from corrupt Southern leaders persists throughout the course of the war, even as the war becomes a hard war, uh, uh, even as its scope expands, even as it becomes a humanitarian crisis, uh, it persists even in the face of massive evidence that Confederates do not want to be saved. And, and so trying to <laughs> riddle this uh, became, uh, uh, you know, became a, a goal of mine. Well, and, and um, you know, Lincoln, you know, you're, you're talking about Northerners generally, but, you know, this isn't a, well, at least I would say, I'm curious what you'll say, but, you know, I would say this isn't a political ploy of Lincoln's either. Lincoln believes this narrative, Absolutely, right? absolutely. That's so important. And I think that, that uh, I, I'm often uh, asked to talk about this. To what extent is this, um, you know, a rhetorical gambit to find a source of unity and to what extent is it a heartfelt belief? I think it persists because it's a heartfelt belief and it's rooted in a pervasive idea that the union was designed by the founders to be consensual uh, and effective theory of the union as an affection uh, uh, that, that the bonds between citizens and not coercion were what the founders hoped would hold the union together. And this idea, uh, deliverance at its heart is an idea that the Southern masses have been duped, seduced, deluded into following their leaders and that if the spell the leaders cast can be broken, they'll come to their senses. This sort of deluded masses theory, the idea that you could save the Southern masses, helped um, Northerners uh, uh, sort of hang on to this idea of an effective union. If you could just punish the guilty leaders and redeem the masses, then your effective union could, uh, could, could be restored. So part of what I try to do in the book really by spending a lot of time looking at soldiers and what motivated union soldiers, what, what motivated them to enlist, but then especially as military historians put it, what their sustaining motivation that kept them in the ranks was. Uh, I find um, again and again, this notion that they are saving Southerners from themselves fills emotional needs for them. So yes, it's a heartfelt belief, it's an ideology, but it also fulfills emotional needs to help those Union soldiers believe that they're doing good and that they are acting as liberators, not conquerors. The, um, the, the kind of narrative that's come out of military history in the last, I don't know, decade or so, maybe longer, though, has been this idea that, um, that the, the North starts with this idea of there being this large number of Unionists who, who can be persuaded to rejoin the Union, and then the war teaches them differently, and that explains the transition from soft war to hard war. Um, your, in your narrative, that, that the deliverance narrative maybe changes over time, but it doesn't really go away, that, that Northerners aren't ever really, or a lot of Northerners anyway, and Lincoln in particular, is never really disabused of that notion. Is, yeah. Is that, yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, I think the, the soft war to hard war narrative has some problems. I think we've learned, among other things, that there's elements of hard war present from the start, especially in the border states. And we know that uh, Lincoln uh, and, and Northern leaders cling to this hope of changing Southern hearts and minds till the very end. In some sense, as I wrote this book, I realized it was the backstory to a story I told in my book about the end of the Civil War, Appomattox, about Grant's leniency to Lee and what he hoped to affect. That is, again, repentance and atonement and, and, uh, uh, and changing hearts and minds through that, uh, through that magnanimity. But, you know, th this 
Uh, I believe that hard war tactics are present from the start, but soft war appeals persist. And I think we can see this if we think, think about something like Lincoln's signature emancipation policy. We've tended, I think, in the, the dominant narrative, as you've put it, to imagine that the turn towards confiscation acts and towards emancipation is, is part and parcel of that turn towards hard war, and that Lincoln, knowing that the Northern public is skeptical, justifies emancipation on pragmatic grounds as a military necessity, as a way of punishing and hurting the rebels. And, and that's true, but it's only part of the story. Lincoln also makes idealistic arguments that emancipation will have broad benefits for all of American society, including and especially for the white Southern masses who he believes have been victimized and duped and seduced by, uh, by the slaveholding elite. So there is a, uh, you know, this sort of, um, uh, uh, in, in, in giving freedom to the slave, we preserve freedom for the free. This idea that, to paraphrase, this idea that emancipation will enhance freedom uh, for everyone is an idealistic argument that um, that uh, represents the the persistence of these kinds of hearts and minds ap uh, 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 appeals. Uh, one more thing I'll say on that subject is that, and this was a bit of a revelation. I love studying 19th century rhetoric and 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 trying to be mindful of how it's different from our own political language. I mean, we don't use the word deliverance very often in our political language. We don't use words like union and disunion and so on. And one of the things that became clear to me is that, um, you know, part of the reason we are wedded to this soft war to hard war narrative is we think uh, that, well, you know, once the scope of the war expands uh, and the amount of, you know, pain inflicted by both armies expands and the human costs of the uh, war expand and the brutality expands and the, and the uh, barriers between home front and battlefront seem to dissolve, um, you know, the era of soft war is over. But what we have to realize is, is if you're in the frame of mind of 19th century people, they believed that pain could be redemptive. I mean, this was their religious worldview, you know, sort of trials by fire uh, 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 and, and, uh, and, and, and the like, but it was also their medical view. This was a world in which, you know, a medical science told them that a, a wound wasn't healing unless the patient was in pain. And we see a lot of metaphors to that effect as unionists describe this commitment to, to, uh, uh, to deliverance. We'll have to hurt you to save you uh, uh, is, is, is essentially the, 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 the frame of mind. That's really interesting. Um, before before we go on, I probably should ask you to do this before we got on this line. We've already gotten a question. Someone wanting to define hard and soft war a little bit. You did a little bit in your answer, but maybe yeah. can you just give a more straightforward definition of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, <laughs> the way we've thought about soft war is um, the various incentives that the uh, union was offering the Confederates to lure them back into the national fold and reassurances. So, uh, that would be uh, Lincoln and Congress promising that the North had no intention of dismantling slavery where it already existed. They were not going to do that forcibly. The archetypal soft war uh, instrument was Lincoln's offer of, of gradual compensated emancipation to the border states to say, if you free your slaves voluntarily, maybe over a very long time, we'll compensate you for them and we'll send them away as to try to incentivize a gradual change that is uh, uh, sort of driven um, by, uh, you know, uh, 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 gradual uh, decisions. Um, and, and we've imagined things like the confiscation policy, uh, where the property of rebels uh, 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 is going to be confiscated and where slaves are going to be, enslaved persons are going to be considered contraband of war who fall under the, the, the umbrella of a confiscation policy. We've imagined that as hard war. We've imagined uh, as, as sort of symbolic of that turn. For most people, hard war is synonymous with Sherman's march, the, the destruction of, of, of Southern infrastructure, uh, uh, war supporting infrastructure, or of Sheridan's burning in the valley of, of resources. Um, so, so people associate hard war with, with um, uh, tactics in which uh, uh, you are targeting both the resources of the enemy, military and non-military, but also waging a kind of war of intimidation to try to target the morale of the enemy. 
And, and, and part of my argument about the persistence of, of these, you know, soft war hearts and minds kind of appeals is that they're, they're, that, you know, the goal of the union war was for the errant brethren to come back into the fold fundamentally. And as I say in the book, to get back to this thing of language and metaphors, unionists described Confederates as pupils who needed teaching, sinners who needed saving, madmen who needed to come to their senses, drunkards who needed uh, you know, to sober up, uh, prodigal sons who should return home. All of this language conveyed that the ultimate aim of the union war was to make the union whole again. And that, that aim drove uh, union policy. There was no political will in the North for a war of extermination, annihilation, conquest, and so on. The idea was to bring Southerners back. That was, that was, that was uh, the point. And this rhetoric of deliverance uh, sort of helped, um, uh, helped uh, articulate all that for Northerners. Yeah, and that's, that's interesting because, yeah, the other part of that narrative, the kind of, I'll say traditional was not that old, but software to hardware narrative is that what motivates that turn is not only how fervently the Confederates are fighting, right, um, but also then the re resistance they experience from on the home front from Confederate women and, and, right. uh, and other people. Right. Um, and, but you make a good point though, which is, well, if, if they, if the union then comes to the conclusion, well, these guys are really serious about this, so we'd better really stamp down on this. Well, then they can't believe, or they're going to have trouble believing right. that you can have a harmonious union afterwards, right? Yeah, well, exactly. And I mean, I, we, you know, one of the things we 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 talked about discussing, which you're you're segueing into nicely here, is is you know what was the degree of of dissent and opposition uh, within the Confederacy? And was it naive of, of Northerners to believe that they could change Southern hearts and minds? And, and it's an interesting question to answer because in retrospect, in our retrospect, we can see that in some sense it was naive. Most whites in the Confederate States were diehard Confederates and had no intention of, of uh, deserting the Confederate cause. Even in defeat, they had no intention of repudiating their leaders. This is a hard, hard lesson that Northerners learn. On the other hand, from their perspective of not knowing what we know and so on, uh, Northerners like Lincoln looked at what was happening in the South and they saw signs that this deliverance was working. They saw, um, for example, they thought of Kentucky, Missouri, these slave states as essentially Southern places that had to be wrested from the hands of aspiring secessionists. And they believed that in places like Maryland and Kentucky where twice as many men chose to fight for the Union Army as for the Confederate Army, that those were cases of deliverance working. They looked at a place like West Virginia, breaking away from Virginia uh, and, 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 and adopting an anti-slavery constitution as, 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 as a win. They looked at the progress that the Republican Party made in places like Maryland and Missouri as evidence that deliverance was working. They looked at, you know, and they clung. What, what's, what, what fascinated me was the way Northerners were so invested in this belief. And, and as I say in the book, it's an ideology. It persists because it's a worldview. And we fit the evidence to, 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 to support our worldviews. That's how ideologies work. So whenever Northerners saw evidence of co Confederates deserting, evidence of Southern refugees who welcomed uh, Freedmen's Bureau rations, wounded Southern soldiers who Northern nurses ministered to and, 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 uh, and felt that they discerned some gratitude on the part of those soldiers. They clung to those anecdotes to support the idea that it was still possible to change hearts, hearts and minds, even in the face of all this evidence that, that it wasn't. Um. Wow, so many, so many directions we can go here. Um, and please keep your um, questions coming in, folks. Where uh, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on them, and, and there's a couple here I want to, I want to actually bring up in a second. But, but first, another concept um, probably that would be helpful to talk about for our, our view, uh, the people watching is um, your. I want to say, pre disunion was your previous book, right? Or was right, there a book right. in between? Them? Right. So your previous book was also. A, a kind of broader narrative and a synthesis. Um, you wrote a book on the coming of the Civil War called Disunion, which is which is also an excellent book. And this idea of the slave power conspiracy 
um, is not a new idea right. in the Civil War. It, right. It's a, one of the motivate, main motivating factors behind the Republican Party. So there's a continuity there. Absolutely. So yeah, if you want to talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Again, part of the reason this deliverance rhetoric has its roots in a Northern critique of the South and in particular, a Republican Party critique of the slaveholding South. And that critique held that there was a slave power conspiracy, elite Southern slaveholders had dominated Southern society and indeed national politics, though they were a tiny minority of the, of the American population. They'd done so by winning over some sort of truckling Northern Democrats. They'd done so by creating a closed society in the South. And, and in this, as, as, I, as I rattle off the elements of this Northern critique of the South, you will discern and understand that it was, it was right in, 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 in many ways. In a sense, there was a slave power conspiracy. Southern leaders did conspire to uh, censor uh, the males in the South, to make sure that no abolitionists would feel safe there, to, 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 to crush out free speech. So, so part of the Northern uh, uh, sort of calculation was that most white Southerners didn't own slaves. Surely Northerners imagined those non-slaveholders must resent the political domination of slaveholders. Surely those non-slaveholders must want some of the benefits of free society. Northerners looked at, compared the two sections and said, in every measurable, you know, sort of a, a hallmark of human progress, the North is doing better. It's got more industry, it's got more agricultural output, it's got more schools, more newspapers, more colleges, uh, more opportunity, and so on. So they imagined a, 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 that there must be a, this group of disgruntled, uh, non-slaveholding white Southerners. And over the years, there were just enough su white Southern dissenters, not very many, but enough to help keep this hope alive, the Hinton helpers and, and, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, and so they, again, hoped that if they could, in a sense, break the spell secessionists had cast over that, uh, that, that uh, white Southern majority, um, they, uh, they could change hearts and minds. The problem is they didn't appreciate the degree to which a pro-slavery ideology had sunk its hooks into that, uh, in, into that population. And, and so even something like, and historians of the South have emphasized this, it's true that most white Southerners didn't own slaves, but it's also true that if you look at the number of white Southerners who hired slaves, who were related to slave owners, who worked for slave owners, who hoped to one day own slaves, the, 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 the investment in slavery as a, as a system of, of, of profit and of, uh, of social control was a society-wide investment among white Southerners. And so Northerners, in a sense, failed to, to recognize what a powerful grip pro-slavery ideology had on had on white Southerners. And of course, Southerners have their own narrative. Um, they have their own conspiracy narrative where they think the abolitionists are secretly, you know, um, that's why they don't believe Lincoln when Lincoln says he doesn't intend to mess with slavery in his, in his first right, inaugural. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, and then over the course of the war, um, you know, Confederates have their own motivating narratives um, that you talk a little bit about in the book. So yeah, what's the what's the yeah, flip side then mean, to the Northern narrative? Yeah, it's important to 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 recognize again that while the premise of the Union War is that Southern the Southern brethren, the prodigal sons, the errant Southerners, must be brought back into the fold, the premise of the Confederate War is that that can never happen. That these two people can never again be countrymen. So the, the need to establish that that can never happen again is what drives Confederate rhetoric, Confederate policies. We can look for keywords on the Union side, deliverance and liberation and redemption and some of these words I've been using to describe this, this uh, effort to change hearts and minds. If we look for the keywords of Southern political rhetoric, they are extermination, annihilation, conquest, degradation, pollution. These are the things the Yankees threaten, according to uh, according to uh, secessionists. So we do see deliverance is fundamentally, we can talk about this more later, a trope that is very much rooted in, 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 uh, in Christianity and in Protestantism and, and, and uh, in Exodus narratives and so on. So it's a common cultural heritage on both sides. And we do see Confederates at times speak of deliverance, their deliverance from the hated Yankee foe, uh, as you've alluded to, sometimes we see them speak of, of uh, for example, delivering the population of, uh, of Kentucky or of Missouri, these union-held slave states, 
uh, from uh, you know from uh, what they what they call Yankee uh, tyranny. But in general, deliverance rhetoric is much more problematic for Confederates because of the chance that all this talk of liberation will spill over into the sphere of slavery. And right. so we don't see that same that same uh, uh, you know focus on that as 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 we do. Um, uh, you know, as we do on the northern side, and it's very important to note. I mean, one of the, one of the key things I, I'm I'm trying to conjure in this book is that both north and south are divided. Uh, I, I was very influenced by William Freeling's great book, The South Versus the South, about yeah. about um, about fault lines in the South. And while uh, it's true that unionism among whites in the Confederate States is, is there are very few unionists or few and far between. Of course, African Americans are the most important Southern unionists and they're right. at the heart of this, uh, at the heart of this deliverance narrative. And I make a point uh, in the book of saying that in effect, uh, African Americans, Northern reformers, fugitive slaves, USCT soldiers, um, had their own deliverance narrative, the, uh, de deliverance narratives, the, Exodus story, the story of Moses had been part of, 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 of black abolitionism for decades at this point. But uh, African American deliverance narratives are broader than, than, the, than the, the version that most uh, white northerners cling to. That is to say, African Americans like Frederick Douglass believe that they're fighting a war on two fronts, a war against the horrors of Southern slavery on the one hand, from which they need deliverance, but also a war against persistent racial discrimination in the North, mm -hmm. where African Americans are technically free, but are, but are relegated to a sort of second class citizenship. And so deliverance is defined by African Americans more broadly uh, to include deliverance from racism, the national sin yeah. and scourge, not only deliverance from slavery to, 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 to uh, include black citizenship and the full measure of equal rights and inclusion in the uh, in, in the civic sphere and so on. And so what you see African-American commentators saying again and again is, if you want deliverance, give political rights to the truest Southerners, the tr Southerners who are the most true blue, who are the greatest patriots. Those are African-Americans who are right. joining the Union Army, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, by the tens of thousands. It, it, and we sometimes forget just one other sort of brief coda here uh, that this is I'm really comes right from from the Freeling book. Um, we do have a tendency in our shorthand to equate the South and the Confederacy. The South lost the war, the North yes. lost. But we shouldn't do that because of course there are substantial numbers of Southerners, African Americans, and a small but symbolically significant number of whites who who work for and pray for Union victory. Uh, we, we can forget sometimes that of the 200,000 African Americans who served in the Union Army and Navy, nearly 80% were Southerners, people who had fled slavery to take up those, those roles. So, um, uh, uh, you know, deliverance has all these different uh, dimensions and, and, and uh, variations uh, in, in different communities among different interest groups. Yeah, and you make an, an important point that I, I tend to um, run into a lot at the museum when I'm giving tours, doing programs, and the topic of Southern Unionism or anti-slavery or anything like that comes up in regards to the South. And, and I, it, it, I always remind people that, you know, we're, when we talk about the South during the Civil War, um, uh, more often than not, um, I think, unfortunately, we're not thinking about African Americans. They're in like a right. different, we think of right. them as a different but, group. And though there's right. a huge number of unionists in the South, they, yeah. and I'm not sure Lincoln's thinking about them in 1861 either as unionists, but there's yeah. this huge class of unionists in the South. And that's of course the enslaved population because right. yeah, they, they sure want the union to well, win. Well, absolutely. And I mean, there's just <laughs> levels of, 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 you know, learning to think about these things in new ways. I mentioned Favolia Glimpse, brilliant book about women in the Civil War. And she yeah. said, it's very important for us to see African-American women as unionists as well. And the appreciate, we can talk about men in blue, the USCP soldiers, that seems a pretty obvious expression of unionism, but she and others have pointed out, and I do make a make point of this in the book, that women are integral to every one of these debates, every every facet of war making in both societies. But um, but uh, certainly, uh, you know, Harriet Tubman uh, uh, is a famous example. Susie King Taylor, Harriet Jacobs, uh, one could go on and on to appreciate to see that. 
the, these acts of resistance by enslaved women from small to, 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 to uh, you know, large as, as destabilizing slavery uh, and as contributing to its demise and as political acts is, is a very important part of this understanding unionism in this, in this broad sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've had a couple questions so far that touch on, I'm going to try to combine them both. They're sure. both um, asking um, to some, into one way or another about union soldiers and this deliverance narrative and does it evolve over time? Yeah. So yeah. particularly in that context. Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I mean, at union soldiers are so you know, so so uh, fascinating uh, in the way that they that they think about this. Um, and, and it gets back to our discussion about to what extent was this a rhetorical posture and to what extent was a deeply held belief. And let me put it this way, if I'd only seen this deliverance rhetoric in speeches and sermons and editorials, but not seen it in the letter a soldier writes home to his wife or in his diary entry or whatever, I might have had, you know, pa paused. But I did see this deliverance rhetoric. We are here to save these benighted Southerners from their own leaders. I saw it everywhere in, in, the, in the moment writings by Union soldiers, from New England, from the Midwest, from uh, the border states, from the mid-Atlantic states, uh, officers and enlisted men at the beginning of the war, at the end of the war. Um, it was as if they'd been handed a script from which to read as they sat down and wrote those, those letters yeah. home. And that, that reinforced that it's a deeply held belief. And there's many things about that that are interesting to me. One of the most interesting was I'm a Virginian, I live in Virginia. Um, uh, again, most of my work has been on Virginia. I was very interested to see, as I was reading, for example, about the Peninsula Campaign and Seven Days and so on, Union soldiers' descriptions of the South and when they encountered the South. And I found that by and large, when they're writing about Virginia, for example, when they landed at places like Yorktown, you know, the site of the yeah. Great Revolutionary uh, Battle, that they weren't describing the South as, as a forbidding enemy country. They were describing it as, as their own homeland, part of their country, their patrimony, the, a, a, a place of, of unmet potential, of faded glory that had that free labor, a free labor system would regenerate a place that had failed to, to, to live up to its potential because it had been scourged by the blight of slavery, as so many of them put it. Uh, and, and it's a reminder that, you know, um, that these Southern soldiers, uh, many of them, uh, I'm talking in particularly, uh, I mean, uh, uh, these Northern soldiers, Union men at these early phases of, of, of the war, the kind of men who, whose letters uh, uh, on the Virginia Peninsula, letters and diaries I read, venerated the Southern founders, you know, uh, di didn't want to, uh, didn't imagine that the war would bring a, a permanent, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, alienation uh, from the South, but that it would restore a kind of um, imagined past that the secessionists had betrayed. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so the, uh, the, you know, so that that's that's really really uh, key. And then you know, when um, soldiers' letters and, and and you know change over time. To get back to this question about hard war. We associate Sherman more than anyone else with hard war. He wrote a lot of verbiage suggesting, you know, Southerners should be punished for, uh, you know, for starting and waging a uh, hard war. But even Sherman imagined himself as a as a deliverer, as a liberator, and he wrote in instructions to his men as they as they as they uh, were on Sherman's march to to practice what the historian Mark Grimsley has cleverly called a kind of directed severity to, to yeah. be harder on the slaveholding elite than on those poor people who might, again, be seen as their victims, who might be dupes, whose hearts and minds might be changed, who might be less guilty, uh, and so on. Sort of sliding scale of guilt. Well, and, and um, I, I'll, I'll, I won't, I'll try to get on my soapbox for too long here because this is about your book and <laughs> my work, but um, I wish I'd read your book when I was doing uh, my stuff on music because Marching Through Georgia, I mean, read the lyrics, fits with this perfectly because it turns Sherman's March into an act of deliverance. It 
March, uh, Sherman's March is rejuvenating the South. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you didn't get to read song. my book while you were writing yours, but I read your book while I was reading mine. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so uh, as you will note, so uh, yeah, that's exactly right, and 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 it's uh, uh, it's it's right there, and that's a late in the war. Song. Very late. Not yeah. early in the, it's at the end of the war song. So yeah, yeah they the, it it absolutely reconciles this idea of it's a hard war action, but they're right. casting it in a different light. And the soldiers love that song. It's one of the absolutely. last big soldier anthems of the war. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to. We we're getting a lot of questions now, which is great. So I'm I'm just trying uh, the sure. um, and I think we wanted to get on this earlier. So I'm glad uh, one of our our viewers brought us back to this, which is um, that enslaved people had their own uh, obvious um, deliverance right. narrative too. So can we talk a little about that and how that evolves over time? Yeah, well? I mean, I, I had as a, as, a, as a goal in this, um, in, uh, for, for this book to uh, really integrate social and political and military history and to, de de to define political history broadly to take in this realm of reform and resistance by free black reformers and by fugitive slaves and to have uh, Frederick Douglass feature uh, play a large role, but not not be the only sort of spokesman for this 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 uh, rich political culture to include uh, to include other um, uh, other voices. And so uh, you, you know, there's subtle differences, some some subtle, some not so subtle differences between uh, African Americans. Uh, deliverance narrative and and uh, the, the the sort of rhetoric of, of white political leaders and and soldiers. I've mentioned the big difference, of course, is is the broader hope that the notion that the nation needs deliverance from from the sin of, of racism and 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 in African American versions, it's white Northerners who still need to be delivered too from from that uh, sin of which they uh, of which they uh, partake. Um, but another difference, not at all surprising, is that um, African American rhetoric it is much less focused on this idea that um, white Southern hearts and minds can be changed. They're under no illusions that that's going to be easy. They, they have they have a they have a sense, a much uh, uh, starker sense of the broad complicity of Southern whites in the system of slavery. So so they they discern more carefully among the white Southern population. They see see most of them as very steeped in this in this uh, horrific racist pro slavery ideology. They they have some hope. For the for the true blue white Southern Unionists, the ones who never supported the Confederacy uh, and who seem open to this, uh, to uh, uh, you know these kind of broader uh, uh, arguments. Um, uh, so even white Southern Unionists, they were relatively few in number. Uh, they can we can sort of arrange them on a political uh, uh, spectrum. And 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 African Americans were very skeptical that there was going to be any fast changing of hearts and minds, which is why they emphasized so much when it it becomes time to reward the unionists. Let's make sure you're rewarding with the vote, with, with, with the, the tool that will matter in remaking this society and bringing the blessings of free society to the South. Frederick Douglass and others will say, uh, uh, the vote is absolutely key to that. And of course, we'll see even, um, uh, uh, you know, those who, who fold emancipation into the deliverance narrative as Lincoln does hesitate about voting, but we also see that they succeed in moving Lincoln on yeah. that question. Absolutely. And for particularly key there are USCT soldiers and especially USCT officers. This is a, 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 a new interest of mine. I'm doing a little work on, there are about a hundred or so African-American men commissioned as officers in the Union Army. Uh, most of them from Louisiana regiments, and these men go and you know lobby Lincoln. His famous letter to Michael Hahn, in which he's yeah. really starting to consider black voting, is 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 in part a reaction to this lobbying. So this is just a way of saying these political efforts, this two front campaign, it 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 it, ha it matters. It it really does move the needle uh, uh, ultimately. Um. I'll, I'll jump around a little bit here again because we're getting more questions. We got a question about the role of the press in the deliverance yeah. narrative and, and how, what kind of an impact is the press having? So Yeah, yeah that's that. a hugely important question. And I, I, I use newspapers a great deal in writing this book. Um, uh, again, not exclusively, I have to cross-reference the, the public uh, uh, materials with the in the moment, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, unpublished sort of stuff like letters and diaries. But, um, uh, but you know, for me, the, the availability of newspapers in their digital form meant that I could keyword search for words like deliverance and liberation and see all of the many uses. It was a way of of uh, a reality check for me to, to, to trace the, 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 uh, the uses of the, um, uh, of the term. And, and, and so I found again, deliverance rhetoric was, um, was ubiquitous uh, in, in the Northern press, particularly on the Republican side. Although interestingly, Northern Democrats make up about 40% of the Northern electorate, Lincoln's opposition party and so on. Democrats have their own spin, Democratic editors and so on, their own spin on deliverance. They believe in a sense if you're going to change Southern hearts and minds, you have to deliver white Southerners from the misapprehension that the North is irredeemably radical. You have to persuade them that, that there is a kind of conservative North that can be restored to power and that, that and so on. So there's, there's again, endless, uh, endless variations. But the press is important because certain uh, editors like Horace Greeley, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are uh, in Lincoln's ear uh, all along. The, the press is important um, because uh, um, African-American editors, Elisha Weaver at the Christian Recorder, Robert Hamilton at the Anglo-African and others are bringing those ex the voices of those USCT men in service to a reading, uh, to a reading public. Um, uh, the press is important in, in um, helping Lincoln pivot Really, deliverance rhetoric is tested in the 1864 election. Lincoln under threat from a Democratic opponents. This big kind of rebranding exercise where the National Union Party, uh, a Southern Unionist on the ticket, Andrew Johnson, no accident. This is, a, 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 again, a nod to the power of this deliverance theme. Um, uh, uh, the press is, 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 is key in, 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 in uh, in debating and, and uh, vetting and uh, selling uh, uh, all uh, Lincoln's policies. And, and again, to me, the important takeaway of the ubiquity of this term in the press was that I saw it in every stop along the political spectrum, uses of deliverance, uh, you know, uh, among unionists, but with important variations. Um, we have a couple questions about memory that I want to get to, but before sure. we get to that, I, I do want to talk a little, I want to back up a little yeah. bit. Um, and talk about a little bit more about the book in broad terms, because we've mostly just talked about this question of deliverance, which yeah. is obviously your main theme, but the book is a complete narrative of the Civil War. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I thought, uh, 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 you know, to, for what it's worth, a really well-crafted one. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. I, I was really impressed about a couple things that you do in it, um, or two things in particular that I'm gonna highlight that you do in it. Um, I, I like the way you oftentimes, um, in history books, you know, it, it's hard to incorporate historiography. And I thought it was really um, good the way you occasionally bring in that there are debates between historians mm -hmm. about these things. And then you would usually have a, a, a really killer uh, quote or something where there would be like a nod and then you would untie it right away with it. I was really <laughs> impressed with that. I'm Thank also, you. as, as uh, uh, one of the secrets of, of, I think, Civil War historians, is how hard it is to write battle narratives. Yeah. And you do, such a wonderful job you you the battles are all in there but you cover them really quickly but you do such a good job and that's really a hard thing to do so i really wanted to to commend you for for what a great job you do explaining those battles but doing it very concisely um and clearly but yeah let's let's talk a little bit yeah. then about the kind of broader idea that that this you know this book is a is an overall narrative of the war that you built a synthesis what how you know, this is the second book like this now you've written. Yeah. Um, you know, what are kind of the, what are the, some of the pleasures and pains of writing? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I was commissioned to write a, a book that could be used as a textbook. And so I started without a theme or a thesis. A textbook doesn't necessarily need a thesis. I started with a method and we've alluded to this. The method was to say, let's connect the on the ground struggles of families and, and, and so on with, with the public politics and, 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 and the battlefield and really integrate social uh, and military and political history and not in having a sort of standalone 
chapter on women, but having women appear throughout, not having a standalone chapter on emancipation, but having that narrative right. woven, woven throughout and using the battles to open up into discussions of things like civil war medicine or religion yes. uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, I was also influenced by my long years as, as a teacher. And I, I feel that um, teaching, uh, taking on some intellectual history approach and focusing on big ideas is a great way to make material stick. You know, I don't expect students to, to re be able to remember some event I described five years mm -hmm. from now, but I hope they can remember sort of big ideas. And this book lent itself to a, a being framed by big ideas. Um, you know, for sort of obvious reasons, it became a goal of mine to to make people better understand, and this will segue into memory nicely for us, mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass's famous speech of 1878, where he says there was a right side in the war and a wrong side, which no sentiment ought to cause us to forget. I wanted students to understand what Douglass meant by that. Douglass said that as part of a broader argument that civil war was a war of ideas, a war, as he put it, between the old and the new, between slavery and freedom, between barbarism and civilization. Now, you know, he didn't mean that all Northerners were moral paragons. He's at the vanguard of fighting this battle against Northern racism. What he meant was that even after you have accounted for the political variability in both sections, and even after you've accounted for the war's brutality and its human toll, fundamentally the Union and the Confederacy represented two starkly different ideologies and two starkly different destinies for America. And that's what he meant when he said right and wrong, not perfect and, you know, and, 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 and imperfect, but, but he was drawing attention to that distinction. So I wanted students to understand some of these big ideas that, um, you know, union ideology posited that the country should no longer be run by a small group of elite slaveholders, whereas Confederate ideology posited that the country should continue to be run by a group of, a, a small group of elite slaveholders. Union ideology posited that American slavery was, uh, was uh, uh, you know, bad and a drain on American society and that in one way or another, on one time timetable or another, it would be better if it were to fade away or to be dismantled. Confederates posited that slavery was a positive good that should be perpetuated, uh, uh, you know, indefinitely. The Union gave us Abraham Lincoln, this, this uh, you know, not perfect man, but a man of humility, of moral striving, who grows over the course of the war. The Confederacy, as Douglas was very much emphasizing in that speech, gave us these false idols like Lee and demanded that people literally bow in worshipful reverence before these false idols. Th these, are, <laughs> these are big differences. And to understand the ways in which the war was a war about ideas and, and, and to understand those ideas in their 19th century vocabulary, deeply contextualized, um, you know, what, what, what ended up being a, 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 goal of, a goal of the book. And so, uh, although, you know, and reviewers have noted this, um, we could debate, the, I make a case that deliverance ideology is central and was prevalent and so on. That's something that, like most other historical interpretations that is open to debate. But I love the idea that a student reading this isn't just being presented as, at, with something that trying to pass itself off as a seamless narrative of, you know, large age history as it happened, but is being led in, in selective ways, led in on the little secret that we debate and discuss everything. And that, and, and, and there, there are standards for sound arguments and unsound arguments. We're trying to teach students what they are, but, but I, I, as a teacher, I feel that a textbook that has a point of view is more interesting than one that is, that doesn't because it, it, you know, uh, 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 you know, creates some possibilities for some, some back and forth and for some questions about how we historians do what we do, how we reach our conclusions, do our research and so on. Yeah, and, and I just wanna reemphasize um, again that, you know, that it, although you obviously had a textbook in mind when you think the word textbook, you right. know, there's a, a particular image. This, right. this does not read like a textbook no. at all. I, it, I, I would encourage, it's a very readable, history of the war. And if you want to read an overall history of the war, you know, um, I don't want to. No, uh, no. I mean, I'm glad you, you said that because I, I should, you know, yeah. to be perfectly clear, I, I, 
you know, I told Oxford University Press I was not going to write a conventional textbook, and I asked right. them to bring out a version of the book that is a that is a that is a popular history, which is what yes. which is what this is. Um, it, it 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 you know it's, it will have a second life in which it doubles as a textbook. But I wrote a a narrative history that is meant to be broadly accessible, meant to be a good read. Uh, and and meant to you know sit whatever on, on Barnes and Noble and so on uh, as well as uh, be useful to students for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most a lot of our uh, people watching are probably familiar with McPherson's Battle Cry of Freedom. Yeah. That's like the standard narrative history yeah. that Sam Warbury knows. But this is if you want the most up to date, you know, the the that Liz does a fabulous job of incorporating a lot of the major trends in. Civil War historiography. I mean, of course, I was inspired by McPherson. I love that yeah. book, you know, but it's been yeah. decades since it was written and right. so much great work has been done. And it was a major goal of mine, as you said, to synthesize all this work. The idea that the point of this book methodologically should be to interweave the social history, if you will, emancipation, women's history, medicine, or religion with the military history that 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 was my goal because so much good recent work by you and others has done that so 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 that was so that was the that was kind of the the, the point is to bring to, to sort of have an updated uh, updated version of the McPherson book which yeah, and it, also it, by the way came out in a kind of textbook form you know uh, trying to yes yeah. <laughs> yes that's a dirty secret on that book too yeah is that it was uh, it but yeah it, and uh, so anyway yeah it's it's a fabulous book let's let's move on then to the um um, this is outside the scope of your book, yeah. but yes, we have gotten a lot of questions in particular about the, the lost cause narrative yeah. of the civil war, uh, which, you know, um, I'll, uh, you know, that's the pro Confederate narrative of the war that develops in the decades after the war to, to give the briefest. <laughs> um, so if you could talk a little about that narrative, how that narrative develops, how it fits in with your book. Uh, we had a specific yeah. question about military bases named after Confederate generals. That's yeah, all yeah, yeah, sure. Issue. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the lost cause narrative, and I write about this pretty extensively in my book on Appomattox, one of the points of that book is to say, even as Lee is surrendering, the seeds of this lost cause narrative are being planted. And it has a mm -hmm. number of elements. One is the, the, the uh, idea that the Northern victory is um, essentially morally invalid because it was a victory of might over right, of brute strength over, uh, over Confederate uh, valor, of, of, of you know, uh, 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 Goliath over David sort of, uh, sort of uh, 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 narrative. And Confederates began laying the seeds of this even during the war itself, again, with all this so unionists argued, we, we want to save you from your leaders. Confederates argued back that uh, before the first shots were fired, Confederates began arguing that the Yankee war was a war of merciless, brutal conquest. And they did that in part because Confederates were attuned to this union deliverance rhetoric and wanted to preempt it and discredit it so that it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Uh, so they tried to build a kind of ideological shield to prevent that disunion, uh, that uh, rather deliverance rhetoric from, from making uh, any headway in the South. And, and so they, Confederate rhetoric demonizes Yankees as mercenaries and hirelings and, 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 uh, 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 you know, uh, as essentially as, as, as again, brutal conquerors and, and beasts. And so that, that all gets folded into this lost cause idea that, that, uh, that um, the Confederacy lost, not due to any failings of its own, but because it was overwhelmed by the numbers and resources, as Lee says in his famous uh, uh, farewell uh, address to his troops at Appomattox. Um, but it has other elements uh, uh, as well. You know, part of what I argue in Appomattox was that um, part of the purpose of denigrating the Union victory as a victory of, 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 uh, of might over right was to say that the Union hadn't won any right as a result of that victory to impose its political will on the South. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we see from the start in the early days of Reconstruction, uh, Confederates uh, and ex-Confederates uh, sort of unwilling uh, to accept that the Union had won any kind of moral victory or victory right. for its principles um, uh, in the war. So the lost cause becomes the foundation of resistance to Reconstruction. Uh, and, uh, and it takes on, uh, in essence, the, the lost cause is also a view that 
while they've lost on the battlefield, the cause will one day prevail in the po political realm. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and the lost cause is, is such a terrible distortion uh, on so many levels. One of the things it does is sweep under the rug this history of Southern unionism that I've described and posit that there was a solid South, again, that there were no fissures in Southern society. It's a way for Confederates to banish any thoughts of self-recrimination, that mistakes might have been made on their side, that divisions in their own society, that poor leadership might have, might have brought them down. So it's, it's an effort to, to banish those sorts of thoughts. And then it's an effort to galvanize opposition to Reconstruction and the lost cause over the decades as Reconstruction, Congressional Reconstruction unfolds and then falls in the face of a massive propaganda campaign and right. violent clan violence, white supremacist terrorism in the South, uh, the lost cause then um, sort of takes on the defeat of Reconstruction as the symbolic moment of vindication uh, 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 on, on the part of uh, Confederates. The lost cause has one more key element, and that is that it is, it represents the terms on which Southerners are willing to, Confederates, I should be careful, heed my own, yeah, my right. own warning. It Former represents the terms yeah. on which Confederates are willing to reconcile with the North. So we, we all uh, know that um, Reconstruction is very fraught, that in the late 19th century, a sort of cult of reconciliation between the North and South emerges. People are weary of conflict. White Northerners, as David Blight has explained in his, in his brilliant book on all of this, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are more and more in, uh, inclined to sort of bury the hatchet as they see it. The lost cause is the demand by Confederates that they be, they get to share the moral high ground with, right. with Northerners. That all, everyone was good, everyone was fighting for a good cause. Lost cause posits that slavery wasn't really the cause of the war state, the defense of states' rights was, but oh, by the way, slavery was also a benign institution. This right. is part of the lost cause. Uh, so this is exactly what Frederick Douglass is bemoaning when he says, please don't forget there was a right side and a wrong side in the late war. And he says that at a, at, at a moment when the lost cause is, is, is saying there was no wrong side. There, there was, there, there were, there, the, 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 again, the moral high ground can be shared. So reconciliation in the North, it, it involves a measure of capitulation to this lost cause idea that, that you could have the men on both sides, uh, men on both sides and on pedestals. Well, and I think we're going to wrap up here in a moment, but I want to directly answer one of these questions. You, you just touched on it, this um, idea that there's a, a moral um, equality between the two right. sides. That, right. that is, that's you know, one of the questions we have was, how do you end up with forts in the South? named after Confederate generals, that's how, because... Yeah, that, that's, that's how, exactly. Right. Well, and because the lost, I mean, what people have to understand again, and so much of the recent, you know, excavating of the, of the, the politics behind the erection of all these Confederate statues has highlighted this, is that the lost cause ideology went hand in glove with Jim Crow disfranchisement, Jim Crow segregation, Jim Crow uh, violence, that, that, that it, 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 it's... Uh, overt political purpose is to uh, is to glorify the Confederate past and to uh, and to promote the political dominance of the white Southern elite, restore it and perpetuate it. And so all these things, alas, uh, you know, go are, are linked very, very, uh, very much. And 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 it's uh, again why why Douglas is so. Horrified, you know, D I should note Douglas isn't the only one who's horrified to see this right. happen. There's some white union veterans who are also very, Absolutely. Uh, you know, and black union veterans very, very uh, upset to see this. But yeah, it's it's a long, uh, long, complicated story. Yes, and and gets us a little uh, away from the book. So yeah, I, I'll just, I'm going uh, to uh, hand it off to Jamie here in a second, but I just want to say one more time um, how thrilled I, uh, I am that you were able to join us tonight. I think this, I hope... Um, our viewers found this as interesting as I did, uh, and uh, it really is it really is a great book. If you're interested um, in, uh, in this idea of deliverance, or if you just want to read a really good narrative of the war that's very readable and, and, and uh, covers kind of all the work being done right now, brings us more up to date with historiography than the other um, 
uh, narratives of the war uh, out there, you know, please go uh, pick up Liz's book. It's it's a great read. So well, thank you, Liz. Thank you, this is, this thank is you a lot everyone. Of fun. And if folks have questions we didn't get to, I am yeah. happy to answer them. So just shoot me an email. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Barron, and thank you, Dr. McWhorter. We want to thank everybody so much for joining us tonight. I know I gained a lot of insight, and by the questions asked, I know our members really appreciated the discussion. Again, like Christian said, we want to encourage everyone out there to buy Liz's book if you haven't already. We encourage you to shop at your local bookstore or wherever books are sold. Um, and like, like Liz mentioned, I will provide her email for anyone who might have a follow-up question in the follow-up email that you will get within the next day. Um, again, if you enjoyed tonight's program, please encourage your friends and family to purchase a membership so they too can enjoy this type of members-only content. Um, or consider purchasing a gift membership for a friend that you might have. And as always, if you can support the ALPLF mission by encouraging Lincoln Scholarship, please do so by making a donation tonight at www.alpln.org. As you close out uh, the webinar tonight, there will be a short survey that pops up. It will take you 60 seconds or less. This does just help us to improve our offerings every single time. So again, if you could take the time to do that, thank you. And again, thank you, Liz. Thank you, Christian. And thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.